It's been a while since I've done a user submission uh, design review video, and you guys seem to really like them, so I wanted to do another, but honestly, I don't get many submissions anymore. I think that's mainly due to with the Discord channel, we do a lot of reviews just on the channel itself. So instead of doing a user submission, this is going to be a open source project that I found online. It's a really interesting project and it has some component choices, one of which I'd never really seen before. And I think it's gonna make for a pretty neat video. So with all that said, let's jump into it. So the name of the project that I'm going to review is called Astro Hat, and it was designed by a user named Pyros. I found this on this website called Kitspace. It has a bunch of open source projects that you can kind of scroll through and see any that you might like. The description of the project is a Raspberry Pi 4 compatible hat for astronomy equipment. And on this site, it gives you kind of an overview of all of the parts used. You can download Gerbers and order directly from some other sites but it also gives you a link to GitLab where you can get the raw files. So according to his GitLab, it has six 12 volt controllable outputs at a three amp each, and each of those are current monitored, and two of them are PWM controlled. There's a temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor port, which goes to the outside world. There's a one adjustable six to 12 volt output. He doesn't say on here what the current draw is. We can look into that later. There's a port for serial communication and power to an external device. He is claiming that would be for a GPS unit. The most important spec though, is it is automotive grade electronics and design. We will see about that. And then it has the render and then how you can contribute and what license it's under. So like normal, I'll start by going through the schematic. And before I jump into any specific block, just kind of an overview of the overall flow of the board. The first thing, I have a big preference for having all of the connectors on the left hand side and the right hand side of the schematic. So basically my schematics, I'll try to make them red from left to right. So all of your input connectors, which are most of these would be over on the left hand side. And then the output connectors would be on the right. It just gives it a really easy way to kind of follow how the logic goes. So we have one single input that comes in through a buck converter gets bucked down to five volts. That five volts is then used for all of the logic on the board, including the Raspberry Pi. To prevent the Raspberry Pi, if it's powered separately from back powering the rest of the board, he uses a P-channel MOSFET, and that just helps to separate out the two power sources, and the Raspberry Pi is what is controlling everything else on the board. He uses a set of three two-channel high side outputs, and these are the parts that I was mentioning in the intro. They're really interesting and we'll dive into them a little bit later, but basically they have some communication and they allow you to toggle on high or low from the high side, two channels each. So he uses three of those to have four plus two, so six total high current outputs. And those are what are powering whatever you would use for astronomy he mentioned like some heaters and dehumidifiers. To be able to use the current sensing function of these ICs, he has an ADC chip here, which takes the analog inputs from the drivers and converts it to an SPI digital signal, which is then fed into the Raspberry Pi. He uses this adjustable linear power supply, which takes power directly from the VN and then using a digital potentiometer, which is adjusted again over SPI from the Raspberry Pi, you can adjust what voltage is output. And that goes to one of the connectors down here. Like it said in the description, he also has a couple sensor outputs, which one of them is presumably for the GPS, and then the other is just a I squared C, but he only puts out the SDA instead of the SCL. So I don't know if that's just an error or if there's something you're intending them to be on a common clock. I don't really understand what this output is. So the first block I'll dive into is the input buck converter. 
It doesn't explicitly say what input voltage he's intending it to be used with. The datasheet for this TI buck converter says that it's good up to 60 volts. I'm going to doubt that anybody would be using it with that high of a voltage, but you know, it's there. It outputs the 5 volts, which like I said, powers everything else on the board. He doesn't list what his anticipated current draw is going to be, but everything on the board other than the Raspberry Pi, I wouldn't expect to draw more than maybe 100 or 200 milliamps. So the Raspberry Pi is by far going to be the most power hungry unit. And from my experience, the Raspberry Pis, they really depend on exactly what you're doing on them. But I think up to like an amp and a half is pretty normal. But a big thing with them is they tend to have really high transients. So if you're on Wi-Fi or doing something intensive with them, the current draw will swing pretty significantly from maybe 200 milliamps to a quick 6-700 milliamp spike. So looking at the datasheet of the buck, like I said, it can take up to 60 volts input and it can output up to 3.5 amps, so that all should be perfectly fine for his board. It has a fixed switching frequency that can be adjusted anywhere from 100k all the way up to 2.5 megahertz, and that's adjusted by the RT clock pin. So using figure 7, we can use his 56.2k pulldown resistor on the RT clock, and judging by the graph, it's about 1.7 megahertz, so it's a pretty high frequency converter that he has. The good thing about a higher switching frequency is it lets you use a smaller inductor so it saves space, but you have to worry about EMI a lot more because the harmonics at a higher switching speed are obviously going to be much more severe. So I threw all of this information into the Python script that I've shown in the last couple videos. It's based on a TI app note 1197, and it's a pretty useful tool. It lets you see a bunch of information when choosing values for a buck converter. I'm going to eventually, hopefully soon, get this entire equation and the entire script thrown up on our website just so it's kind of like a neat little helper tool. So I put in 12 volts input, 5 volt output, 2 amps on the output current, which is probably on the high end, but you always want to shoot high instead of low. 1700k frequency, a 0.9 efficiency. The input peak to peak is what the input ripple will be. And that I threw out 100 millivolts, which is kind of a standard rule of thumb. Series inductance, he does not have any filtering element here, which in and of itself is a is not a good way to design this. So 560 nanohenry is just kind of a stray uh, inductance value. The output transient current I have sent to 0.5 amps, which like I said before, that is tied almost directly to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi does not have a smooth current draw, so I'm assuming that at any given time, the Raspberry Pi could change from 1 amp to an amp and a half, half amp to an amp. And what that does is it has the effect of saturating the upstream ceramic capacitors. And if you saturate to where there's no more charge left in these caps, you're going to get a pretty bad ringing on this input side. And that's, again, how you can fail EMC testing or even worse, potentially, you can get those inductive spikes that fry something else on your board. So to help prevent that from happening, that's one of the main reasons you have some sort of bulk capacitors here, which he does not have. Based on the equations, he should have at least 37 microfarad, but that is the bare minimum that you want. So I would probably like to see one or two 47 microfarad electrolytics here, and that will help smooth out any inconsistencies on the low frequency end and it will help prevent any issues with the ceramic cap or hopefully multiple ceramic caps getting saturated. So that's everything on the input side. On the output side, he has three 47 microfarad caps. They're 1206 size, so I'm assuming the temperature coefficient is probably not X7 or X5. I, I could be wrong. 
but either way, the output caps tend to not matter that much. Everything else on the output side seems pretty fine, but the input side is definitely lacking. I'll quickly take a look at these two blocks. The first one is the prevention of the backpowering of the Raspberry Pi. Basically, he has five volts coming in from the buck, which then goes through the P-channel FET and outputs to the Raspberry Pi. And this prevents, say, if you plug in the Raspberry Pi with a separate power cord, if you don't have this here, it's going to power everything else on the board. And sometimes, usually not with TI because they build a pretty good converter, but sometimes that can fry the output side of a buck because it's higher than the input side. So this helps to prevent that. And then he uses a two PNP channel transistor array to help prevent any issues with the output side being at a higher potential than the input side. They're normally not required, but it's there in case you need it. And then there's a I squared C E P ROM, which has a write protect connection header, which is pretty nice. You can toggle write protection on or off. I assume he's just using this for some configuration pins or something else. Because with a Raspberry Pi, since it's obviously a Linux computer, you can store anything on the SD card. So I'm assuming he has a specific reason for it, which I don't know. And then he has a single decoupling cap on here. So these two, I really don't see any issues with. The next two blocks are the variable power supply. So he is using a linear voltage regulator in LDO and a digital potentiometer or a digipot. The digipot is used to adjust the voltage that is output. In sense, to my understanding on the GitLab, he did not show any information on what this should be used for. Since he is allowing the user to set this to whatever they want, the fact that he's using a linear regulator in my mind is a really bad idea. Since this is dropping it just linearly, if this is set to 5 volts or 3.3 volts and it draws like half an amp or an amp, it's going to burn this thing up because you're dropping from 12 volts. So as long as this is limited to tens of milliamps, I think it works fine. But there needs to be some sort of prevention to prevent this from drawing too much current or at bare minimum, just some sort of guidance to say, hey, don't draw more than 100 milliamps at whatever voltage. But otherwise, it should work fine. And I think it's a pretty clever use of a digipot combined with an LDO. So now the real interesting part in my mind of this entire board are the three high side drivers that he uses to power the high side loads. On GitLab, he says that there are two PWM loads, which are, I assume, channel five and channel six. Now, to my understanding, everything on these are identical. So the only possible reason that I can think of why these are the only two PWM lines is on the Raspberry Pi, he has them set to a hardware pin that is on the Raspberry Pi that can do hardware PWM. I personally don't know enough about this Raspberry Pi to know if that's the case, but that's my assumption. So we'll quickly take a look at the block diagram of that part, and it has two identical channels that are able to power through out one and out zero, a load from the high side. So internally, it handles the gate control with a charge pump. So all you have to worry about is powering it with whatever your control voltage is. And using the N0 and N1, you can turn this load on and off, and you can also PWM it. It has some pretty good protection built in, over voltage clamping, over current protection, and the over voltage clamping they state is good enough to be able to prevent from inductive flybacks, but I still always like to have something external just in case. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on how these pins are used because frankly it, it doesn't matter for the sake of going over this, but you're able to get out what the current is at any given point you're able to see if there's any fault conditions and a lot of good diagnostics data so looking back at his schematic he has three completely identical blocks for each one of these drivers he has the two channel enable pins fed to the raspberry pi the den and dsel are also fed to the raspberry pi 
and then the I sense line, because that's an analog line, gets fed to a separate ADC, which outputs over SPI. Now on his ADC line, he has some good RC filtering. He has a pull down, and then he also has a TVS diode. I noticed that this was listed as an optional section in the data sheet of this part. I'm assuming that's only when it leaves the board. I can't really figure any other time where this would be needed. It doesn't affect anything because any extra capacitance is going to be negligible to everything else. So it's not hurting anything, but I don't think it's required. The ADC does not have any decoupling, which since this is an analog IC is pretty bad. The high side IC also only has 67 nanofarads. So both of these are drastically lacking in decoupling. And of course the SPI lines also go back to the Raspberry Pi. So that's everything I wanted to go over on the schematic side. Overall, I would rate it probably a C, maybe a C plus. There's nothing egregious, but a lot of the little things add up. The issues with the buck converter and the analog side, it definitely would not pass any EMI testing. There's probably going to be some data integrity issues on the analog side, but otherwise it is pretty solid. The only other suggestion I would maybe have is while those high side drivers are very neat and I'm definitely going to keep them in mind, I think you could get the same functionality just by using a low side MOSFET in some sort of direct analog to digital current sense that avoids having to have so much analog side when you really don't have to. So I'm already almost 20 minutes into this review and I haven't even looked at the PCB yet and there's a reason for that. I'm really not going to critique this much in my opinion, this layout is sufficiently flawed to where I honestly don't think that it would be worth going into, and I'll show you the main reason why that is. So I'm planning on doing a video in the next couple months on designing specifically two-layer boards, and essentially it can be summarized in one thing to keep in mind, and that is you have to, no matter what, do everything in your power to keep the bottom layer clear of traces of course you're going to have to use it for routing here and there but when you have entire paths covering half of the board of traces on the bottom layer no matter what else you do you are destined to have really bad current loops because any trace that needs to cross over here it can't have a return current directly under that trace and that causes really big ground loops, it causes signal integrity issue, and it causes really bad EMI. Furthermore, on this, he is separating these zones all over the place, and he has many copper layers that are split up, which is one, kind of confusing to follow, and two, especially on a two-layer board, you're almost never going to get anything out of that other than just causing more and more issues. And do keep in mind, just because I'm being harsh on this, I'm not saying that it won't work. There's plenty of boards out there that are similar to this or much, much worse, and they do work. My point is, there's enough here that, in my opinion, is wrong that it wouldn't be worth trying to go through and point out every single thing because, in my mind, you would be better off either A, going to a four-layer board or just completely restarting it from scratch. So that wraps up my review of the Astro Hat project. I primarily covered the schematic, but also touched on the PCB layout a little bit. Did it live up to the expectation of automotive electronics and design? Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll let you be the judge of that. But as always, let me know in the comments any suggestions for future videos. And if you liked this video, please don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next video.